Glad to have you here for the 61st annual Wild Hog Dinner, the unofficial kickoff to the 2024 legislative session. Georgia Agriculture Commissioner Tyler Harper addressing a packed crowd at the Georgia Railroad Depot for the Wild Hog Supper, where political networking is on the menu, along with the smoked pork. Good evening and welcome to day one of Lawmakers for 2024. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. Today marks the beginning of the 54th season of the show, and we're excited to continue bringing you all of the action under the Gold Dome and giving you context on what it all means to you. The General Assembly gaveled in today for a session expected to cover a wide range of issues over the 40-day session. Plus, it's an election year for all state senators and representatives. We're going to give you an idea of what to expect from leaders in both the House and the Senate who will join us in the studio and lay out their priorities for the coming weeks. But we begin with our Capitol Report, as always, with our new Capitol correspondent, Sarah Callis. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having You've me. You've been a part of Lawmakers for a while. We're going to talk about that. But first, I want you to get right to what happened at the Capitol today. Thanks, Donna. The House started the 2024 legislative session on a somber note, as lawmakers remembered three lives already lost this year. Representative Sandra Scott struggled with the loss of her cousin, Brandon Harris. He died in a shooting in Forest Park on Friday. Scott called upon lawmakers to pass gun safety laws this session. Well, as a family member, I'm, I'm hurt. Um, and as a lawmaker, I'm frustrated, angry, um, and just wanted Georgia to do something, come up with some type of common sense gun legislation, because we must have some. I know we can't stop what's going on around the world, but Georgia, it is time for us and the state of Georgia to come up with some common sense gun legislation. Representatives also honored Coweta County Sheriff's investigator Eric Minix. He was killed in a police chase. We rise today, the members of the Coweta delegation, along with Chairman Collins, to honor uh, one of Coweta's finest. Eric Anthony Minix age 31 of Noonan, was promoted to his heavenly home on Thursday, January 4th. And Representative Trey Kelly recognized Polk County Commissioner Scotty Tillery, who died this month after a battle with cancer. Scotty wore a lot of hats in our community. Uh, he called himself just an old dumb plumber, but anybody that knew him uh, knew he was much more than that. And his fingerprints are left all over Cedartown and Polk County. In the Senate, a bipartisan call for unity and empathy of those who have been victims of recent swatting pranks. Don't understand what swatting means. Let me take a moment to explain that. As when someone thinks they're making a prank telephone call and saying someone has been either shot or murdered and they might be then holding some type of hostages, hanging up the phone trying to solicit the police department to literally send a SWAT team and a cadre of other public safety vehicles to your house. New proposed legislation is expected to add increased penalties for the crime. For those who think that this is a prank, it's actually a crime. I want to thank the senator from the 45th for leading the way on upcoming legislation that you will see that will add criminal and civil penalties on top of what already exists today. I think that we face a real challenge moving forward with this session in an election year where the risk of culture war is at its highest. And that is, when it comes to the very basics of government, are we going to do what's necessary, not just to protect our members from a law enforcement, a public safety perspective, and protect the public at large, but are we going to protect our shared commitment to govern for everybody and not assume the worst of each other at some of the most difficult, vulnerable moments that we face? Senator Sonia Halpern also rose today to mark a special anniversary. Today marks the 50th anniversary of Maynard Jackson's historic election as the first black mayor of Atlanta. In just a few minutes over in City Hall, they will also be doing a celebration of this. But I wanted to say here that Maynard Jackson's legacy is not just merely a chapter in Atlanta's history. It is a testament to the enduring power of leadership and the profound impact one individual can have on a community. And last night at the annual Wild Hog Supper, lawmakers celebrated the start of the legislative session 
and raise funds for Georgia's food banks. The event also touted the role that Georgia's agriculture industry plays in stocking those food banks. Not only is it the kickoff for the legislative session, but it's an opportunity to celebrate our state's number one industry, to celebrate agriculture, to celebrate uh, the farm to food bank program that has been so remarkable in, in providing over 30 million pounds from our farm families here in Georgia to the food banks all across this state. Lawmakers will continue the session tomorrow with day two. That is my Capitol Report. Donna? So uh, you did such a great job. I'm so excited you're a part of all of this. I do want to mention one of the things you mentioned in the, the story, and that is swatting. And tomorrow on Lawmakers, two of the victims, two lawmakers who were victims of swatting will join us here in the studio, so we'll hear more about that. So you already got us started on some things. So it, I want to talk about you now. The, it, it's been great to have you here, and today you, you've done your TV, but you've done radio, you've done print, and you've been doing that for a while, and it involves politics and the Georgia Capitol. So tell me about that a little bit. So I've been working behind the scenes on Lawmakers since 2022, booking guests for the show and writing the digital stories every day. And so then before that, I was an intern with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in college, where I covered the legislative session and elections. Yeah. And so I'm excited this year to continue covering the session. And you can find me on the radio in the off season covering all things Georgia politics. That's right. You do a lot with politics. You like politics, so you're into it. <laughs> uh, we've got a busy se session ahead of us. We're glad you're going to be a part of all of that. And uh, so thank you so much for being here. You'll be at the, at the Gold Dome more often. So you won't be next to me, but, you know, I'll, I'll get a chance to say hi to you. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Sarah mentioned uh, last night's Wild Hog Supper. Well, I was there too. I spent time at the event asking some lawmakers what's on their agendas for the legislative session. And I began with House Majority Leader Chuck F. Stration. I'm so excited about the legislative session. We've got great issues that I think we're, are going to be debated this year. Public safety continues to be a top priority. We've had a study committee looking at law enforcement compensation, make sure that are working law enforcement officers across the state are compensated appropriately for keeping us safe every day. Georgians deserve to feel safe, particularly in their own homes. Early childhood education and literacy continues to be a major focus. We passed some great legislation last year, and, uh, and we want educators also to continue to do the great job that they do in the classroom. We've got some terrific measures. I think when we look at the function of EMS, it's almost like police, fire, and EMS. And so, I feel that that's a function that should be addressed by government. Many of our EMS providers are either nonprofits, for profits, or some sort of combination, but they're not truly operated by governmental entities. And I think as a taxpayer, you want to make sure that when you call 911 and you request an ambulance, it's not somebody on the other end staffing for profit to make sure that they can afford to do it. This is a government service. I'm going to continue to uh, make noise about the school choice voucher bill. I don't think that's in the best interest of of Georgians. Uh, we're going to continue to work to address the need for more housing, what the state can do to get creative with state regulations for housing. I've got some bills about that. Uh, I'm going to address uh, many businesses that are going cashless. Uh, to me, that is a discriminatory practice that you say, well, I only accept cards. Uh, with the amount of fraud happening across this country with people's identities, I think we should be okay if someone wanted to come into an establishment and pay with cash. It's legal tender. I've been working on some property tax reform. Um, hopefully it's going to be helping out. Uh, I have a couple of bills I'm pushing that were actually dropped last year. One of them being a Samaritan's Purse bill for individuals who um, have health care call sharing ministries instead of their standard insurance for a number of reasons um, to be able to use that as a, a potential tax credit. And um, let's see, also working on a um, mobile home bill that passed the House. Uh, mobile homes in the state of Georgia are taxed like a tube of toothpaste. This bill that passed the House actually would tax them more like real property, so it would make them more affordable. And I believe it could be an answer to our workforce housing crisis. They can be created in a matter of months instead of a matter of years. If you get outside the metro area, people um, understand that mobile homes make up a large part of our population. Um, actually, uh, the Mo Georgia Mobile Home Manufacturers Association have two houses in Metro Atlanta. They got sheetrock walls. They're mobile homes now. Sheetrock walls, um, tile showers, granite countertops. They have front porches and garages. You would never know they're a mobile home. 
um, and they were made in a matter of months. So there are, it's just a great opportunity. They're made in Georgia. They're brought to where they need to go. So hopefully we can get that across the finish line. It would save people, you know, several thousand dollars on the purchase of their manufactured home. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we are supporting our students. We want to hopefully work on the uh, funding formulas for Georgia. We want to make sure we're supporting our teachers. And we want to do everything that we can that we don't fight for money out of the budget to go to private schools. So I think that's, you know, we worked really hard and we defeated SB 233, I think it was, last year. We know that uh, it was being reconsidered and we're hopeful that our Southern uh, representatives uh, in South Georgia will remember that the students are our priority. And so that instead of fighting against taking money out of the budget, let's do everything that we can to support our kids. Because the majority of Georgia students are in public schools and if we really worked hard, I believe we could really uh, transform Georgia's education. This year I'm focused on uh, what I believe matters the most, kitchen tables, t table issues, making sure that we strengthen public education, uh, to make sure that we focus on health care and access to health care and caring for our seniors. And then of course, making sure that there are jobs and particularly supporting our small businesses. More than 80% of our jobs come from small businesses. And too often we have the state support these really big companies and these big developments when we really should be focused on uh, the backbone of the state, which are small businesses. We all know we've got to change the UI system. It was built in 1982. That's already underway, underway with federal funding right now, but we're gonna to have to have some appropriations. We're a donor agency, which means we send $25 million over to the state treasury every year. We need at least eight to 10 to make sure that we're adequately serving the people and preparing to protect this trust fund. Our trust fund right now, um, it, it's not where it needs to be, and we need to be building it for the day of which we're really gonna lean in on it. You need to build that fund up in the good days like we are now, and it's gotta become what we call solvent, and we're not there right now. Um, we're running about 1.5 billion. It really needs to be closer to 2 billion, and um, the way to be able to do that is to mitigate the fraud and to make sure we're processing claims in an expeditious way and efficient manner. Now, the fund that Commissioner Thompson is referring to deals with unemployment insurance. And, of course, quite a few Georgians applied for it during the early time, early days of the pandemic. We'll have Commissioner Thompson on lawmakers in the coming weeks to talk more about that and other initiatives in his office. You'll also see all of the other lawmakers I interviewed at the Wild Hog Supper on our shows to tell us more about their bills. But right now, coming up, we hear from leaders on both sides of the aisle. They'll tell us their priorities for this session. You're watching Lawmakers on GPB TV. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy, the Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. People put their faith in PBS because they know that it is constantly delivering quality. It covers the whole of the United States. It's a free and independent media. We go where the viewers are. What are the conversations that are happening right now? We feel that civil discourse is a civic responsibility. What we do is authentic reporting that people can trust. We give time so you can hear voices on all sides of an issue. This is the place that people turn to for stories that matter. And they know that when they walk away, they will have learned something about the world around them. That's why this makes TBS important for daily life and in the end, our world. Thank you for joining us. Community. 
Learning, working, playing, celebrating, doing life is always better together. At GPB, we aim to provide you with the tools to be able to do life together well. Our mission to educate, inform, and entertain inspires everything from our wide range of programming to our stimulating radio conversations to our fun in-person events. We've got something for everyone. Visit gpb.org slash community to learn more about our upcoming events. Welcome back to Lawmakers, I'm Donna Lowry. On this, the first day of the General Assembly, we continue to dive into what to expect over the 40-day session. And I'm pleased that joining us are two leaders and they both represent Macon. First, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, John F. Kennedy, representing District 18. He's a Republican, first elected in 2014. He served as floor leader to former governor, Nathan Deal, as a freshman lawmaker. Then as caucus chairman for the Senate majority for several years. He's also a former chairman of the Senate Redistricting Committee. Also with us, we'll switch gears now, is House Minority Leader James Beverly, representing District 143. He's a Democrat, first elected in 2011 and became House Minority Leader in 2021. His committees have included rules, appropriations, ethics, health and human services, retirement, special rules, and small business development. Welcome to you both. The Macon area, you're, you're making them proud right now. Thank you both for being on. So I wanna dive right in, and so let's start with those priorities. So I'll start with you. Um, what are your priorities for this session, President Pro Tem? Uh, Donna, thank you, and thanks for having us, and thanks for having me and, and uh, Leader Beverly. Um, you know, we did a lot of good work in 2023 with some good conservative budgeting, and that set the stage so that we can continue to provide income tax relief for Georgians. We, uh, two years ago, rolled the state income tax level back to 5.75, and that we are put that on a, on a trajectory to hit 5. Uh, four nine, and with the press release with the governor that Governor Kemp had, with several of us being with him, uh, we're looking to take that to 5.39 this year to eventually head toward 4.99 percent. That's going to really leave taxpayer dollars in the pockets of Georgians, and that's where it needs to be. That's one of the priorities I've got. One of the other ones is working on edu an educational issue. Um, we made some really good decisions and observations over the last couple of years that saw some legislation in 23 regarding literacy rates in Georgia. And while we had been focusing on graduation rates, we realized that the literacy rates were not really keeping up with where they needed to be. And so in the Senate and some efforts in the House, uh, we have focused on literacy rates. And one of the things that we've seen that uh, a lot of folks and where James and I are from in Macon and Bibb County, um, we have a program called Leader in Me, which takes the, the seven habits of highly affected people and puts it on the level of school-age children and high schoolers. And it has been wildly successful in middle Georgia. And we have taken the, with this past year's budget and we're taking that to 29 school systems around the state something we're really excited about and seeing that being implemented so that children really can have the skill set they need not only to be successful in school but to be successful in life and be successful as Georgians and we're excited about that. I know a lot of people are excited about what you're doing with literacy in the school system so we're going to see an expansion of that then. I think so. It's a, the literacy the leader in me program is great. We're going to continue to focus on how do we get the literacy rates up because at this point most folks recognize that for third graders who are not reading on the third grade level, it puts them on a trajectory where things are not going to work out. Uh, there's a, a, an alarming rate of folks for children that don't read on that level that wind up in the prison system. And that's very disturbing and that's something that we want to do something about to give those children not only the Georgia dream but the American dream which begins by having an education and that all begins with the ability to simply read. Yeah, and I know literacy was pretty bipartisan but I want to get into your priorities. Talk about them. Yeah, Donna, thanks for having us and always good to be. I think we've been together for the last week three or four times it's <laughs> unbelievable great but anyway i'm glad to be here um our priorities this year five the five pillars number one we started with maternal mortality there's no reason for women to be suffering the way they are in the state of georgia uh, in maternal mortality so we have to focus on that second we have to expand medicaid you can call it whatever you want to call it 11 15 waivers you can call it whatever but we have 450,000 georgians right now no health insurance and that's unbelievable 150,000 kids unwound from Medicaid last year. We have to do something about that. 
Third thing, we got as the anniversary of Roe v. Wade comes up, we're going to deal with women's issues and women's ability to be free to choose what they want to choose, how they want to do it. No one should be able to tell you when, where, and with whom to have a baby. And then lastly, we're going to deal with gun safety. And we have to deal with that as Sandra Scott uh, had someone, uh, she lost someone. We have to deal with that this year. Yeah. For sure. It was certainly, yeah, as uh, Sarah mentioned, pretty somber today to, uh, to hear about uh, all the deaths and all. So we'll get in a little bit more. I want to focus on one thing, and that's his talking about expansion of Medicaid. What do you think the feelings are? There, I've heard that there is more interest in that possibility. What are you thinking on the Senate side when it comes to expanding Medicaid? Donna, I think there is an interest in what we really want to do is make sure that we look for smart ways to de deliver cost-effective health care to more Georgians. And with that as the driving idea behind this, that's one of the things that, uh, quite frankly, Governor Kemp led on two years ago with uh, Georgia Pathways and a way to have a limited Medicare expansion. Um, he worked uh, diligently and only just this past July did the green light come from Washington to enable us to actually implement that program. So I think from our side what we're looking at is let's take that program in which there's a lot of excitement about and let it get legs, let it, let it develop, let it do what it's intended to do and then we'll take a look and see what else might need to be done. But I, I think you're right, there is a, a growing awareness uh, and consideration of other options of how do we make sure that we get affordable, good health care delivered across the state, not just in the metro areas, but in the rural areas. So one of the things we've heard about is that there's a possibility or maybe something that will deal with uh, cons, certificates of needs, which for people who don't understand it, regulates hospitals, that there, there may be some type of discussions to kind of loosen that a little bit in exchange for something when it comes to Medicaid expansion. Well, the interrelationship of those two, I don't know. We'll see how, this, how the session unfolds. But you're right. Uh, we passed a certificate of need bill and sent it over to the House. That's one of the issues that we're looking at because that is viewed and understood to be an impediment to being able to deliver cost-effective health care all across Georgia. Um, and the other issues, uh, we'll see how things develop. Obviously, today was day one, and a lot can happen and will happen over the next 39 days. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what you just heard? Yeah, so I think that the work requirement that Governor Kemp placed on saying you have to have a job in order to have health care, I think it's wrong. And the results are shown. You know, not been 20,000 people have signed up for that already who've qualified. And so there's, there's a sensible way to do it, and that is take the federal money and expand Medicaid to all. And if we do that, we cover 500,000 Georgians tomorrow, and we can do that. Let's be sensible and let's move it forward. I see that we're going to talk a lot about that this session. Uh, I want to talk to you both about the next issue, and that is last session, the Senate bill to expand school vouchers, uh, SB 233, passed soundly in the Senate uh, along party lines, but the measure died in the House mostly because Republicans from some rural areas joined Democrats in voting against the bill. So, um, Pro Tem Ken Kennedy, tell me what your thoughts are on that. It, are we going to, to, first of all, it is something I, I understand the Republicans like because we've had it come up before. Are we going to see it come up? And in what in what capacity, maybe? Great question, Donna. And in fact, the bill that uh, we passed out of the Senate last year and went to the House and failed on a close vote uh, is still alive. And it is there for another vote and to be considered this session. We hope that the House will continue to consider that and vote on it. It is a priority of the Republicans uh, in the legislature. Uh, you know, families should not be hamstrung by having a child in a failing school and not having options and being able to do something. And that's what this is about. It's called school choice, but it's really parent choice. And it's giving a child the best opportunity. And it's also very important to remember, this is not anti-public school by any means. Uh, it is simply a way to let those families that have a child that's forced into a failing school to have an alternative. And the way the statute that is written that we pass out of the Senate also only impacts the lower 25 percent, basically the non-performing schools, of, of previously referred to as a failing school. So this is an important opportunity, and we want families to have that in the event that they have a child that's in a failing school to give them an alternative, because that child's future, we know, depends upon the education that they receive. 
that shouldn't hinge upon the zip code that they live in. One of the things, one of the reasons it did not pass in the House is some of the rural Republicans joined with Democrats in deciding that they did not, voting against it, part of it was the feeling that they may not benefit as well from the vouchers in their areas because there may not be alternatives. What do you say to that? Well, I think part of that, and, and as they say, all politics is local, and we've got a lot of rural, rural areas where our senators and House members come from, where the school system may be the largest employer in the county. Um, and that's a political, uh, a, a, a significant political force on folks. And it also, I think, is one of those things that for a lot of areas and a lot of schools in Georgia that aren't failing, that are doing a great job in educating the schools, ed educating their children, don't really understand and maybe have a grasp for some of the failing schools and the plight that these families are in and the parents who are trying to get their child in a different school. But I think there's a growing recognition of it, not only in Georgia, but across the country. And uh, so with that, I hope, and I have a renewed hope, that, there's, that the House will give this additional and new consideration and hope that it will, will be passed this time. And Governor Kemp has already said he supports it and will get it to his desk, I hope. That's certainly another issue we'll be watching. I know how you, you feel about this, that you're, you're going to continue to fight t against school vouchers, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and the reason is, I mean, it's, you have to have wraparound services to give kids a voucher. And so you, have, you can then go to this school, but you don't provide transportation. Yeah. That's a tragedy. These kids are not failing just because they're failing. They live in communities where they just don't have transportation to get to the next place. Yeah. How do we deal with that? When a kid's poor and they need a belt or they need an extra meal and you just use your voucher to get them to school, what do we do with those kids once they get there and when they come home? And so there's a lot more issues than just saying it's school choice. It's what are the services that you have to provide for the kid to get access to the service in order to make it work. And they haven't talked about that yet. And so we'll see what happens as we have this debate. Okay, they're already telling me we're running out of time, but I want to get some things in. Mm. And one of them is the uh, last year the Senate didn't take up the anti-Semitism bill. Uh, do you expect that to happen this year? What are the chances that we might see a floor vote? It, it was voted on, but it's a House bill. And... and uh, so how do you think it's going to do in the Senate this year? Absolutely, Don, and I'm glad you asked about that because unfortunately we didn't have the time to take that bill up this past year in 23, but I can tell you it is absolutely a priority. It is a personal priority and a priority of my office to make sure that we get an anti-Semitism bill passed out of the Senate and passed out of the legislature and on the governor's desk. This is an incredibly important measure, and we knew that last year, but it's become even more crystal clear with what happened October the 6th and what we see what's going on in the world stage. Georgia has to have this, and I look forward to pushing this and working with our colleagues to make sure that as we close out the session in 24, we have an anti-Semitism bill that Georgia can be proud of and that will provide protections uh, that are, quite frankly, very needed. Yeah, I do want to talk about uh, one of the things you mentioned of, the, of your five. The last one dealt, dealt with guns. Talk about what the specifics are on that. Yeah, specifically, I mean, you have to have, so when we, Sandra today, Representative Scott, said, laid it out. And she said, look, we have to have some safety measures for guns. You shouldn't, there are people who are going to get guns who we should have background checks on. We don't want folk who have harmed people to go into a store, get a gun, and walk out. That's nonsense. And we start to, and when you see that kids are, are harming themselves because you don't have safety measures in your home, and kids are picking up guns and accidentally shooting someone or shooting themselves, it's a tragedy. And those things we can deal with right away and we need to. Yeah. Do you think there'll be any room for any gun legislation? I think what the acts that often are attributed to the need for gun legislation really point to a need for greater mental health services. And that's what we're working on. You know, we, we passed uh, HB 1031, and that was a great initiative. And the House Bill 520 came over to us. We're working on that. A lot of our senators uh, in our caucus have been working on that in the off season. And we're looking at addressing that and making sure that we can get better mental health services out to Georgia. Georgia's been behind on that, and we're okay. trying to catch up. Well, I'm sorry to cut you both off, but we're, we're out of time. There's never enough time. Sure. Thank you for coming on our first show on our 54th year. So you, you, can, you can mark that down on your calendar. Awesome. <laughs> that does it for lawmakers today. We'll be back tomorrow for day two of the Georgia legislative session. Have a good evening.